I get started with the last panel. Um, as we've heard in a previous panel, <clears throat> or so I've heard, uh, the growth in output and employment in the United States has seen, uh, or the growth that the, in output and employment that the United States has seen over the past couple of years has reduced the amount of slack in labor markets and in the economy more broadly. Uh, measuring the remaining slack is complicated, uh, but I think the evidence is consistent with the view that a significant amount of slack remains. So we still need to pursue economic policies that are aimed at supporting the recovery so as to put more people back to work and raise incomes. Um, at the same time, it's critical for the United States to undertake structural reforms to ensure that strong growth can be sustained over time and also to ensure that the increase in our standard of living that results from this growth is widely shared. There are a lot of areas in which structural reform would be beneficial for our economy, but today we're going to focus on the labor market. That means policies that increase growth in the number of people able and willing to work, as well as policies that increase the productivity of our workers. I'll briefly mention a few of the policies that the administration is working on. Uh, first, immigration reform would increase the size of our working age population and provide a significant boost to potential output. Uh, second, expanding the earned income tax credit for workers without children and non-custodial parents would likely draw more people into the labor force from groups that have low labor force participation rates. Third, there are many ways in which the workplace could be made more inclusive and more friend friendly to families. We have a number of proposals and initiatives designed to increase participation by allowing workers to better balance the needs of their families with the responsibilities of their jobs. Fourth, in order to increase the productivity of workers, we have proposed investments in reforms that would increase worker skills via our education system, starting with pre-K and going through higher ed, as well as through our job training system. So I'm hoping our panelists are gonna be digging into these and other issues. We have a great group here, um, Jared Bernstein, who's at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities running their full employment pro project. Uh, Jenny Hunt, currently my colleague at the Treasury Department, but more permanently Professor of Economics at Rutgers. The Peterson Institute's own Jacob Kierkegaard, who is a senior fellow here, and Michael Strain, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. So each panelist is going to have uh, about eight, uh, eight to ten minutes to offer their remarks, and then we're going to have a period for discussion. So with that, we're going to start off with Jared. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to Adam for inviting me. And uh, uh, before I uh, uh, start, I want to say what a, a great day this has been. I don't really have the attention span I used to have, but I've been, uh, I've been just enjoying every panel. And, uh, you know, uh, Paul Krugman, who I, I deeply, deeply respect, uh, often goes on about just the terrible state of macroeconomics, and uh, he knows of what he speaks, but I think if, if he were here today, he'd have to uh, very much revise this, because I've seen... Uh, uh, a lot of great real-world macro from uh, some folks who I rip off, I mean, some folks whose work I, en uh, I enjoy very much. Um, so let me begin. Um, so in assessing, as I just mentioned, in assessing labor market slack, I uh, borrow relentlessly from everyone here, uh, and with one minor exception, I don't feel at all compelled to trot out anything new in terms of the facts of the case. I think uh, the work that we've seen from Jan and, and Bill and, 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 and uh, Andy, Le just uh, 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 um, Adam and, uh, and, and Danny, just uh, uh, make a very strong case. Um, one minor exception in terms of my own contribution, if you have my little deck there, uh, is, is hardly an exception since it really just slaps together two um, different pieces of work which you've actually both already seen, and that's um, uh, uh, Adam and Danny's work and something by Jan Hatzius. Uh, Jan had that, uh, what he called a paleo wage Phillips curve where he, he showed that, in fact, just the unemployment rate kind of explains recent wage trends uh, and uh, how flat they've been, but in fact, if you look towards the end of, and, I, and Jan and I uh, uh, have talked about this, this is not something of which he's unaware at all, but if you look towards the end of his series, um, the unemployment rate uh, overpredicts wage growth, uh, borrowing from uh, uh, Danny and Adam, and in, a, in, in not nearly as um, adequate a form, because I'm just using national data and they have a panel, uh, but they, they, they have more research assistance than I do. Um, 
uh, if you if you actually uh, run a, a rolling regression of um, a, a wage uh, wage growth on the left hand side um, and unemployment uh, and an LFPR the labor force participation rate on the right hand side and you stop that or you start at 1995 by quarters I'm using the same uh, principal component wage uh, series uh, as, as a similar one and you, st you start it uh, you start letting the regression add observations at 2009 q1 um, two things happen first of all you see the labor force coefficient uh, uh, grow in magnitude and grow in statistical significance uh, it explains, uh, it, it actually increasingly explains the flatness in the wage trend. And if you plug the LFPR, and this is, this is beyond reduced form, I mean, this is as, as a paleo, as Jan said. If you actually plug the LFPR into Jan's uh, regression there, what you'll see, and I actually had a little note outside that, that shows this, is that, in fact, you, you do a much better job of predicting the flatness in the wage trend. That tells me, as, as, as Danny and Adam have concluded, that there is a, 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 certainly a cyclical component still left in the labor force participation rate, but I'd go a step further, at least according to the wage correlations, that, that, that component is growing. Uh, it kind of flattens at the very end, but it's growing. So um, I think that kind of stands in a pretty direct contrast to other analyses that suggest the cyclical component is dying off, as you'd kind of expect it to, and the structural component of the labor force gap is growing. Okay, that's the only, that's the only uh, slide I wanted to talk about in terms of sort of more empirical evidence. But I do think, coming off of that observation, that um, wages are critical here. Uh, to both understanding amount of slack, the path for the Fed. I very much uh, uh, appreciate some of the wage targeting notions that have been introduced. And I tried to uh, I've tried to argue in my own work that there is considerable uh, room for non-inflationary wage growth. Um, President Evans, in his extremely, I thought, thoughtful and eloquent speech, talked about productivity plus inflation. So that gets you from its current 2% nominal to, to, to 3.5. But as I mentioned, rebalancing the factor shares that uh, also provide room for non-inflationary wage growth. Uh, Phillips curve is flat, as we heard from uh, the last panel. Um, I, I, was have, I was talking about worker bargaining power uh, just like Adam. Uh, and, and you can see that in my next bullet, low union density. All, all very much occurring, and I think it was um, Bill who made this point, Bill Dickens, all of these uh, facilitators, all of these kind of technical facilitators of non-inflationary wage growth are complemented by a Federal Reserve with very strong anchoring instincts and a huge pile of ordinance in the form of uh, the zero lower bound and a four trillion dollar balance sheet that, that can be unwound. So uh, with, uh, with both a little more empirics on the slack side and hopefully a convincing set of bullets on room for non-inflationary wage growth, let me um, turn to policy for my last uh, few minutes. So the recovery is relatively stronger than that in, in many EU countries and in Japan, uh, but the extent to which demand remains constrained is, is extremely problematic. So if by structural reforms and the theme of this panel, we mean the search for micro flexibilities that would uh, add uh, jobs by moving down the demand curve, reducing the minimum wage or deregulating or repealing Obamacare or blocking you, the sort of thing you tend to hear more about in this town than I've heard about this in the- in this room today, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, I, I, th I, think, I think we'll be very disappointed with the results if, if that's our approach. I think that those kinds of interventions would be uh, more likely to exacerbate already high levels of, of inequality than they would be to boost jobs or, or, or macro, uh, uh, address the macro demand deficiency. Um, I have a bunch of, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip a bunch of statistics um, that uh, uh, emphasize the uh, width of the gap. Now, I very much agree with Karen that things are improving, but the, just the GDP output gap using CBO numbers, and, and I'm talking about the gap relative to CBO's new potential, which is lower than their old potential because of, if not hysteresis, whatever you want to call it, um, the GDP output gap using CBO numbers now stands at 700 billion in the most recent quarter, and that's uh, 2,300 bucks per capita. So there is, there is room uh, to move here and important uh, resources left on the table if we don't. The fundamental problem we face is one of insufficient job quantity and job quality. Uh, and that, 
uh, uh, problem uh, uh, must be addressed, in my view, by uh, not just uh, monetary policy, which has been the focus of today, but fiscal policy and legislative action through which um, uh, uh, we, I understand we can't expect much given uh, our current gridlock Congress. So uh, the fact that um, uh, fiscal and legislative uh, actions are needed uh, and probably won't be taken given politics isn't going to keep me from uh, talking about them and building a project around them as I've uh, mentioned at the, at the Center on Budget. Um, this is a huge problem for the political uh, uh, economy and it doesn't, I don't think, uh, uh, garner much attention at all in DC. In fact, the first person to even mention congressional restraints was, uh, was Steve on the last panel uh, and, and I, I, it's kind of late in the day. I think they're, I think they're serious. Um, I, uh, I consider myself a pretty hard-boiled veteran of this sort of thing around this town. I mean, there's not that much I see that um, uh, um, leaves me aghast. Uh, but the fact that in 2013, we had uh, one and a half percentage points of GDP taken out of the economy by fiscal drag strikes me as not trivial uh, bad policy that you know, Michael and I might argue about on CNBC someday, but uh, deep, deep, uh, political economy malpractice. Um, most estimates would argue that uh, fiscal drag right now is about zero, and that's an improvement. You know, it's better to do no harm than to kind of uh, uh, to, 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 to make things much worse. Um, and perhaps while it's too much to ask our policymakers to help uh, the economy, maybe it's not too much to ask them to do no harm. So, uh, uh, so be it. What do I think we should do? And let me just finish up because I'm sure I'm at the edge of my time. Uh, uh, two it? more minutes. Oh, two more minutes, okay. Um, so what do I think we should do? Um, as, for, as you can see from uh, my, uh, my slides, just skip that next graph and just go to the, it says demand side interventions. I'm very much uh, worried about um, the kind of structural deficiencies that I think Adam was referring to. I think maybe Summers has them in mind when he talks about um, uh, What's it? secular stagnation, this idea that, that we are in a, a bad equilibrium. Um, and and, and uh, clearly, I, I believe that the uh, equilibrium, uh, that the solution to the equilibrium is on the demand side more than, more than the supply side. If anything, the world seems awash in loanable funds, yet fraught with weak demand, pretty unimpressive investment, uh, generating, if not, uh, I, I actually uh, thought the, the hysteresis back and forth argument back and forth between Adam and Larry was kind of where I am, which is, I don't, you know, I, I kind of, I don't know if hysteresis exists, but if it does, I believe in reverse hysteresis. So at that point, you're kind of into nomenclature as the, as the two of them agreed. So I very much agree with Janet Yellen that uh, a tight labor market could reverse some of the damage, pulling some people in. And I take some uh, confirmation of that view from uh, Adam and, and Danny's uh, paper with, I thought, very strong results um, uh, which I've tried to echo a little bit in my, in my reduced form. Um, I have a set of ideas here, but I think in some ways the first is most important. Um, we've talked about monetary policy all day, and fiscal policy has barely been discussed at all. Now, that may be because it's off the table because of dysfunction, but in fact, it's very clear to me that fiscal and monetary policy are complements and not substitutes. The Fed can't do it all by themselves. And if you don't believe me, look back at Ben Bernanke, more so than Chair Yellen, but uh, practically every time he went up to Congress, he was begging them for fiscal policy to complement what he was doing on the monetary side. He was setting the table. Borrowing costs were very low. It was a, uh, you know, the cost of capital was and remains low, but there's got to be um, something on the, on the demand side, uh, and, and there uh, the absence of, of, of fiscal policy has been a huge problem. Um, uh, infrastructure investment in public goods strikes me as uh, um, pretty much a no-brainer, even at this stage in the game. But let me say something here that's a little bit more, uh, may sound a little bit more radical, which is the idea of the government as employer of last resort. Um, in my work on full employment, it's become pretty clear that there are groups in this economy who probably won't find work even if the job market were to tighten up vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the overall average kinds of numbers we've been talking about today, the fives or six percents of overall unemployment. So I'm a big believer that, the sub, uh, that a subsidized employment program is an essential component of a full employment agenda. Uh, 
Yep, I'll wrap up in a minute. And believe it or not, folks may not be aware of this, but we actually had a pretty robust subsidized employment program in the uh, Recovery Act. It was called TANF Emergency Funds, and that's just a, you know an acronym. But but uh, it, it was, I, in my view, it was quite a successful program with a big bang for the buck, and I would scale that up. My broader point here is that if we accept the uh, Federal Reserve as a lender of last resort when the market fails, when the credit market fails, I think we ought to think of the government as an employer of last resort when uh, the private market fails to generate adequate quantity of employment. Uh, I'll stop on my, my last bullet. Uh, I'll leave those two at the bottom off. But let me just stop on my last bullet because I get to plug some great uh, work from uh, uh, PIIE, which is on, on, on reducing the trade deficit. I mean, it seems... Um, uh, very much, uh, it seems very clear to me, um, uh, and uh, I would probably cite a paper by Dean Baker, who uh, wrote a paper for our full employment project, which, by the way, they're all at pathtofullemployment.org if you want to see them. But Dean wrote a paper called something like The Trade Deficit, the Largest Barrier to Full Employment. And I tried to sort of muscle him a little bit and say, come on, Dean, there's like seven other offers. Do you really want to say your paper is the most important one in terms of the path? But he said, no, 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 I really believe this. And I actually found uh, his paper convincing. So uh, the idea that the, uh, uh, the, the extent to which the trade deficit has been a drag on growth and ideas that I see coming out of IIE, particularly the work of uh, Fred Bergston and Joe Gagnon, um, I believe point us strongly in the right direction in that regard. Thank you. Jenny Hunt. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to focus just on a little slice of, uh, of the, st the structure of the economy. And I'm actually going to mix discussion of cyclical and, and structural things. And I'm going to tell you about what's been happening with female labor force participation and where I expect it to go. So if you go on to the second page, I'll uh, start here with a graph just showing you uh, going back actually to uh, 1948, uh, what has happened to female labor force participation. So it, it rose from being sort of 33% in 1948 to a peak of 60% uh, in about 1999. And you can see since then, uh, uh, it's been on what looks like a downward trend, little recovery in the, re in the boom just before the recession and then getting worse in the recession. If you go on to the next page, I, I put this into an international context. So uh, here the United States is plotted along with some countries that uh, happen to have uh, or happen whose statistics have been made more comparable than, than other countries. And uh, you see that the, the other countries' uh, female labor force participation rates are still rising, whereas you can see that uh, because of the, the U.S. is falling, it's now, for example, actually crossed down uh, just below that of the UK. And I'm actually going to say a little bit more about the UK uh, in a few slides. So just notice that UK starts below the US and has really just been uh, keeping on rising gradually, whereas the US, after rising, uh, went on to a plateau and has now fallen so that it's crossed the, the UK. Now, there are a few things that we do know about this decline from 1999. And those are actually not female specific. So there's a, there are a couple of things going on affecting men and women. One of them is the decline in the, the youth labor force participation rate, so up to, up to age 24, falling for both men and women, uh, principally because participation rate is falling among the enrolled, and then uh, enrollment is increasing. And those are both trends that predate the recession. And then, as was just discussed, of course, the baby boomers in 2008, uh, the first baby boomers reached uh, age 62 and began retiring. So uh, we, one could talk about um, structural things to do in that regard, but because they're not actually gender specific, I won't do that. So let's instead look at what the female labor force participation rate is on the next page for uh, women aged 25 to 54. So here the, the x-axis is uh, the, the age and the y-axis is the participation rate, and then each line is for a different year. So you can see the, the I was going to say the blue line, but you can't see the blue line. Uh, but anyway, the line at the bottom is uh, uh, 1980, and uh, you can see that the middle-aged years, here the prime age uh, shifted up to 1990, up a little bit further to 2000, and then have actually slipped back a little bit at uh, the ages except the upper ages 
uh, in uh, 2013. And it's important, uh, and, and look, notice here also what I was saying about the decline in the youth participation rate there. And for knowing what happens in the future, it turns out to be critical whether you think that's an age effect or a cohort effect. Are those young people going to work less for the rest of their lives, or are they going to pop up to the, the higher levels that we see here when they reach those older ages? If you go on to the next page, I put this prime aged um, female labor force participation rate in international context, and here the US looks very low. So it's quite a different uh, story, as you can see. So compared, for example, to the UK, uh, as soon as the US got to that plateau before it even declined, it was overtaken by the, the UK. But it's important to not to think, I, I read an article in the Financial Times that seemed to actually be implying that Americans had become lazy. Uh, if you look, over just focusing on the women here on the next page, and you're thinking just about the total amount of work in the economy. I don't actually have those exact numbers, but what I'm showing you on slide seven now is the percent uh, of female workers who are part-time, and you can see the US and Sweden are down at about 12, and the UK is at about 35%. So you shouldn't think from those earlier numbers where the US participation rate looks a bit low that the overall supply is so low compared to other countries. So if you go on to page eight, I'm just making some comments here comparing uh, the, the UK with the US. So thinking about the overall rate, remember it's just happened that the, the UK caught up with the US and that's because the UK has been steadily rising and uh, the US has had a sharpened fall since 2008. And uh, we know that the sharpened fall in the US and this broad uh, 16 plus group is, uh, is partly due to the recession, but especially due to the baby boomers starting to retire. Uh, in the UK, the baby boom is both smaller and a little bit later, so that hasn't hit the UK yet. So that's one reason for the difference uh, amongst the older ages, uh, that, that uh, they're not aging as much in, um, in the UK. And then it, it's actually considered a bit of a puzzle in the UK why the labor force participation rate did not fall in the recession. There's lots of... Uh, puzzles um, going on in the UK in this recession and recovery. And so uh, if later you can look back and see that there isn't any downturn for the UK in the recession. But that's only explaining sort of the older age categories and, and uh, we saw that the, the prime age labor force participation rates have been diverging since the US reached its plateau in 1999-2000. And, uh, and that's in part because, the, as I showed you, the participation rates for U.S. women in their 30s and 40s have actually been falling, where, and this is really putting it a slightly different way, successive U.S. cohorts are now no longer uh, working more at the same ages than previous ones. And in the U.K., participation rates in 30s and 40s have been rising, and as you can see actually on the next page uh, on slide nine, and successive cohorts are still working more at given ages than the, the previous cohorts. So on slide nine, you can see that uh, I just compared 2000 uh, with 2000, and uh, it's actually 2014 for the UK. Uh, unfortunately, their age categories are a little bit big, but you can see it uh, increasing a little bit in 25 to 34, 35 to 49, and then I suspect the increase in 50 to 64 is probably more concentrated to the slightly older ages, uh, sorry, younger ages, since nothing's much is happening at age 65 plus. Then on uh, slide 10, I'm just comparing the most recent year. Uh, it, it doesn't say the year, but it's 2014 for the UK and 2013 for the US. You can see here that uh, Actually, I meant to mention also on the UK slide that they've also had that drop in the youth uh, participation rate, which is very interesting, just like the US, which means that the, although the numbers are a little bit higher for the UK youth on slide 10, uh, it's, it's not uh, as different as it would be if they had, both countries had not experienced this fall in youth participation. Uh, and so you can see that uh, until we get to the 50 to 64 age bin, the UK has higher participation rates in each of the age categories. So uh, let's turn to, to thinking about explaining these things a little bit then on uh, slide 11. So I'm not going to go through uh, why there was such growth for US women in the 70s and 80s, but uh, let's just think a little bit more 
about uh, why there was an increase in participation rates for prime-aged women in the 90s. So it, it was surely partly to do with the extraordinarily strong um, growth in the economy in the 1990s, combined uh, with an expansion of EITC and uh, in 1996, the tying of welfare to work, so the abolition of AFDC, which didn't require work, to TANF, which required work to get benefits. And the, 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 the EITC expansion and the TANF uh, um, reduced disincentive to work is still there, uh, but the, it may only be with growth of 1990s styles that we'll actually be able to return, I think, to the peak uh, participation rate that we saw in 1999. Although, again, this really hinges the question is what's going to happen with these young people. But if I come to that um, slightly pessimistic conclusion, then how, how can it be that other countries have this higher labor force participation rate? Well, if you go on to slide uh, 12, and I'm still talking here about people in their 30s and 40s, especially uh, prime aged, it, it's, it, there's good evidence, of, actually, I, yes, it's cited, the papers are cited actually at the back, but there's good evidence that uh, countries that offer paid parental leave, subsidized childcare, and more generally family-friendly policies, if the leaves in question are not too long, do have higher labor force participation rates. Women are more likely to come back to work after having a child. Uh, and another policy that differs quite substantially from the US and the rest of the world is that the taxation in uh, most of the OECD is done at the individual level and does not have a disincentive for a, a, second, a secondary earner to enter the labor market. So that's another uh, big, big difference. And uh, it seems that, that all of these policies are drawing in women to work part-time uh, in the other countries. And uh, so some of the increased participation rate actually may stem, in fact, from those much higher rates of, of part-time participation. So, so coming um, back to what's going to happen in the future to female labor force participation, I, I think there is, if you, if you actually turn over, I've repeated on uh, slide 13, sorry, the prime aged uh, participation rate just for the US, so you can sort of see the recent trend. If you, if you sort of eyeball, which is making an assumption that the young are not really going to spring uh, back into participation when they're older, if you sort of eyeball, it looks like uh, there's a downward trend, but that it, it has been steeper during the recession and is likely to recover some. But I think the real slack, so I do believe there's slack in the economy, but I think the real slack is actually coming from the people who are part-time for economic reasons. I think it's not so much because of the participation margin uh, for women in general, but some, but some of it is. So finally, um, the administration does have objectives in terms of making workplaces family friendly. And the, the aims here are or the objectives are to remove obstacles so that those who want to work can. So most obviously, of course, uh, unemployment, but uh, also uh, allowing people who, who might have other obstacles than labor demand uh, in, the, in, in the way to working, allowing them to work as well. And then allowing work to be combined with family. And an important element of crafting these policies is to not only think of women, in fact, although my talk was, has been about women, but to design these policies to include men as well as women. That's very important for their success. So a few examples, well, I've, I gave some uh, on the previous page of already um, naming what uh, Europe does already. Uh, the one that the administration has put the most emphasis on so far is in the FY15 budget. We've proposed 65 billion for high quality preschool education. And then there's, there are the, in the current budget, there's $100 million to help states set up paid parental leave. And there's some other, other things that would fit into this general rubric that I had already listed on the previous page. So, so this is uh, the direction to head, even if it's not the case that workplaces have become less family friendly uh, making them more friendly, family friendly would remove obstacles to women's participation would be likely to increase the rate. Thank you. Jacob? Thank you very much, Karen. Um, well, 
Adam asked me to talk about some international perspectives on structural reform, particularly from Europe. Um, but I guess I just in response to some of the things we were s said in the beginning of the conference, uh, I just want to make a point about data uh, uh, because it was it was made clear that uh, you know we're short of data, particularly for wages, and the suggestion was made that we should look at uh, you know previous experiences in Europe, for instance. Uh, the, the problem with that is that uh, European wage data is almost uniformly unsuited for policy relevant work in the United States uh, until quite recently. And uh, the reason is simple, is that throughout the majority uh, uh, of, of history where these time series are available, you have things like binding national collective bargaining and you know, mandatory wage indexation in place in these countries, uh, which means that you know, we can debate why, the, why nominal wages are sticky in the United States, but uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, moving them downwards in many European countries was a crime. Uh, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, this, is, this is perhaps relevant for academic papers where referees only care about the econometrics that you use in the data, but for policy relevant work, this is absolutely uh, not to be pursued. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, then on this, but I think as Karen also did in the introduction, it's useful to ask what is meant by structural reform. Uh, because I certainly think that in, in Europe, sometimes structural reform is just something that policymakers can propose and then say that the result can only be found after the next election. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, they're not accountable really for their actions. It can also be, in a more broad sense, things that raise employment uh, uh, and potential growth. Uh, and if that's the case, well then Europe actually, in my opinion, has some broader uh, uh, lessons to teach the United States. One is, is as Karen also mentioned, immigration reform. Uh, Europe has actually gone through in the last uh, a considerable number of years a dramatic increase in immigration. Uh, if you look at the EU 15, for instance, uh, legal permanent migration into the EU 15 is actually since the, in the 21st century roughly twice, twice the level of the United States. Uh, it's even higher, of course, in the UK. Uh, 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 after uh, expansion of the EU. And then there is this other element that I was just chatting with Dave also uh, before, which is that you have a lot of latent workers in Eastern Europe uh, uh, that actually uh, can shift back across, uh, back and forth across borders if there are any, you know, the natives begin to ask for higher wages. Well, guess what? The employers will tell them, you know what, we're just going to hire the Pole uh, uh, who's waiting to come in. Um, another thing that the Europeans wisely have resisted uh, is the insanity, in my opinion, of having a direct, direct link between employment and health care. Uh, uh, Europe has never had that. Uh, uh, and, and I think in terms of a, a whole host of, of labor market issues that is, is, uh, we can debate back and forth about the, the uh, ACA, but severing that link uh, would be certainly something that I think the United States should also do and move to a single payer system. Um, so there are things that, that Europe more broadly on structural issues, I think, could teach the United States. Well, then the issue is, well, what about labor markets specifically? And, and there I would say that there is essentially two types of lessons. On the one hand, uh, the one type of lesson uh, <coughs> you can learn is you learn from my mistakes. Uh, and the other type of lessons uh, is you learn from my successes. And I would say uh, the most important lesson that Europe can teach the United States when it comes to structural uh, uh, labor market issues is the one that I have on the first slide, which is do nothing stupid. The, the, the doctrine of not doing stupid things when it comes to labor market reforms in response to crises is actually, in my opinion, extraordinarily important. Because if you look at many of the labor market rigidities in Europe right now, they all started out, by and large, as well-meaning attempts to reduce suffering uh, uh, um, you know, in response to crisis after particularly 1973. And they come in, in many forms. I list a number of them here. You know, excessively early retirement options, facilitating early retirement through unlimited uh, unemployment benefits for older workers, loose definitions of disability, uh, et cetera. 
all basically things that facilitate premature exits, f permanent exits from the labor market. Uh, essentially variations of sort of the lump of labor market fallacy. Uh, um, and then you also have, this is also the origins of many of the excessive, in my opinion, uh, legal restrictions on dismissals for um, uh, economic reasons that you have in many European countries. It's the origins of why labor courts uh, are so dysfunctional in a number of European countries uh, because they were basically tasked with interpreting uh, these rules. And then particularly uh, uh, one uh, which is that it leads to excessive duality in the European labor markets. Uh, and that is, in fact, probably the single biggest problem that Europe has at the moment. And, and by duality, I mean that you have part of the labor market that is, consists of highly protected insiders, and then uh, you have another uh, part of the labor market that are essentially, in sort of part-time, uh, temporary, essentially very flexible and unregulated. Uh, 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 employment, because that gives rise uh, to a, a whole host of, of issues. I mean, if you want to understand why is it that Spain or Greece and others have, you know, above 50 percent youth unemployment, well, it's very simple. It's because the youth were disproportionately employed on these uh, easy to uh, easy to fire. Uh, uh, outsider type contracts, and they, of course, when the economy collapsed, they're the ones that were uh, laid off. Um, and uh, you also have a problem with the political economy uh, uh, of dealing with this issue, because actually the pre-crisis labor market performance in Europe was not that bad. Employment rates, as I think some of the numbers that Jennifer uh, also showed you before, were actually generally uh, rising. But a lot of that came through the expansion of uh, uh, sort of outsider work. You, f you, you liberalized uh, sort of temporary and part-time work, but you really didn't do anything uh, to lower the uh, protections of uh, insider workers. Uh, and, and that is why uh, Europe, and particularly countries like France, Italy, uh, are in such a pickle. Because I think the, the sad reality of political economy of reforms, uh, of labor market reforms in Europe, is that these types of reforms, meaning reforms that reduce protection for labor market insiders, they only happen in a crisis. They do not happen at any other point in time. So if you want to understand why the ECB is doing uh, perhaps less than what many would want it to, you should look at the, uh, you should understand that many on the governing council of the ECB, in my opinion, recognize that the only way to uh, keep uh, or, or perhaps get a serious labor market reform of insiders in countries like France and Italy is to keep the screws uh, on the macroeconomy, unfortunately. So this is certainly something that you should not uh, pursue. Uh, and then in the next slide, I mean, given that this is a, in some ways a follow-up conference to Jackson Hole, I can't resist to say that this is a zombie that perks up in many forms. And the latest articulation of, of uh, this idea of introducing crisis rigidity in labor markets is, is the proposal to have sort of called dynamic labor market rigidities. Uh, uh, which is a uniformly terrible idea, in my opinion, for, for uh, all the political economy reasons uh, that I just discussed. So I'm not going to go into details of why that is. But, but that is a, a, a very bad idea. So the next question then becomes, well, what can Europe positively, uh, what are the successes, if you like, for, uh, that can, in the labor market sense, perhaps instruct some of the policy uh, making in the United States. And there, are, the first thing I want to point out is, is one type of policy is actually the German policy of so-called Kurzarbeit, or short-term, subsidized short-term work. Uh, but it's important to recognize that, that in the German concept of Kurzarbeit, it's actually introducing an additional type of flexibility. It's in introducing an additional way uh, of reducing total labor input uh, at a time of crisis. And at the same time, because the, those workers who go on, on uh, reduced wages, or sorry, on reduced hours, they then get a wage top up from the government. It's a way to introduce in a crisis a very, in my opinion at least, very high multiplicator uh, fiscal, uh, counter cyclical fiscal stimulus. Uh, that really will do quite a lot to protect uh, uh, employment. 
uh, oh, sorry, uh, total consumption. Uh, uh, and I think it's also important, as this slide shows, that this isn't something that the Germans just cooked up in 2008. This is something that they have been using historically in every major recession in Germany since World War II. So it's deeply embedded uh, 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 in Germany. And it's, very, it's a very rational, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't work everywhere. But in my opinion, that if you have a highly specialized competitive uh, sector of the economy with highly skilled workers that suffer an external shock uh, uh, for a relatively brief period of time, uh, which is AKA the German export, you know, machine tools and manufacturing sector uh, in 2008, 2009, this is a very, very uh, a rational policy and it's very, very effective as well, uh, uh, in my opinion. Um, and it works, of course, especially if you have a labor market that also suffers from demographic constraints so that businesses are particularly worried about uh, losing their high-skilled uh, uh, workers. So, so I think this is something that could be facilitated and relevant for some sectors. Uh, in the United, uh, in the U.S. Uh, economy. Then the next and last slide uh, is sort of, and I'm saying this not just because I'm Danish, but but uh, it goes back to this issue of active labor market policies. And again, I will highlight that this isn't a silver bullet. Uh, it's not going to overcome many of the cyclical effects. I mean, the slide shows that if you're Ireland or Spain, you can spend a lot of money on this, but it doesn't help you. Uh, uh, if the housing and construction sector collapses. You can also spend a lot of money on this stuff, uh, but if you have French labor market rigidities, it also doesn't work uh, very well. But I will suggest that this slide does indicate that if you want to get back above 70% and this is, work, uh, this is working age because it's OECD data, if you want to get above 70% employment rate, it does suggest that perhaps the United States could spend uh, more on this and you know all the other Anglo-Saxon countries, countries like Japan and Korea, which have a lower government budget uh, than the United States, spends about twice what the United States does. Uh, which uh, over the five-year average that I plot here was about 0.14% of GDP. The only two OECD countries that spend less than in the United States is Chile and Mexico, not necessarily countries that compete on uh, you know, productivity, high wage, uh, uh, et cetera. So I would suggest uh, that this is uh, another way in which the United States could uh, uh, learn something from Europe, but it may also, and this is because active labor market policies uh, tend to work better the closer they are to the shop floor. Uh, uh, so, so those countries in which they are genuinely very successful uh, tend to have relatively cordial social partner, social uh, relationships between employers uh, uh, and labor unions. Uh, uh, that may or may not be the case in all sectors in the United States, but nonetheless, I certainly believe that one of the lessons from Europe is that you could spend quite a bit more money on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Adam, for asking me to speak. Today has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, it's really just been a, a wonderful, wonderful day. And it's a model for the other think tanks in town about how to do this, I think, because it's really just, just, just been so good and the panels have been so great and, and the people who have been here. Do you, do you want a little of that? No? <laughs> Maybe later. Um, but with PowerPoint. <laughs> yes. I have the, the dubious honor of being the last speaker of the day, so I'll keep this uh, uh, brief. Um, and uh, I didn't prepare any slides, um, so I'll keep it informal as well. Um, I'd like to, to start by just you know, going up to the 50,000 foot level and, and making an observation that, that, that could be considered trite, but that work is very important. And having people in jobs is very important. And you know, everybody in the room, or at least a lot of us in the room are economists, and, and, and you know, nobody needs to be told how production functions work and that if you don't have a labor input, you don't really produce anything. Um, and so if you want the economy producing things, then you need to have people working. But uh, if I could be a, a, a human being for a minute and not an economist, uh, you know, work is, is very important for society. And when de Tocqueville came over to the United States and wrote his famous book, what he was so struck by were the voluntary associations uh, that defined American life. And, and to a large extent, we still have a lot of these. We have little leagues, we have scout troops, we have churches, we have neighborhood associations, we have clubs, we have all these things. Uh, and if people aren't working, those things just wither and die. 
And that's terrible for society. It's terrible for the health of society uh, as a whole. Work is essential to human flourishing. You know, again, if we're, if we're up at the 30 or 40,000 foot level, you know, what do we have an economy for? Do we have workers to serve an economy? Do we have workers to fill roles in markets? Or, or is it vice versa? Do we have an economy to help people lead flourishing lives? Do we have markets to help people uh, find what they're best at and contribute as best as they can? I, I think the latter. Um, and so when you have policies in place, demand shocks, supply shocks, whatever, uh, you know, whatever uh, is the problem du jour that is a threat to work, that's a threat to human flourishing. And uh, it requires a policy response. And that's something that I think that, that everybody should agree on, whether you're a conservative or, or a liberal or, or whatever. Um, we can debate what the policy response should be. Um, and uh, there's you know, plenty of room to do that. Uh, but I think, I think hopefully we can agree that there should be at least some kind of a policy response. Um, you know, obviously demographics matter. And that's been a big uh, focus of what we've talked about today with respect to labor force participation. Uh, but for prime age workers, uh, we should be concerned by what we're seeing, both with respect to men and women. And we should try to design policies uh, to encourage work. That's a normative statement. Um, it's a, a statement I'm comfortable making because I'm, I'm not being an economist right now, being a person. I'll go back to being an economist in a minute. Um, but I think we should encourage work, and, and, and I think that society works better. I think it's better for people. Uh, I think it's obviously better for the economy, and, and um, it's something that I don't think a lot of people in the room would disagree with, especially based on what everybody said so far. Um, so, you know, what, how do we do that? In some cases, it means reforming programs that could be uh, better. Um, in some cases, it means using public policy to, to give uh, workers and, 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 and non-participants a hand up so they can, they can participate. Uh, and so I'll just throw a few of, of, of those ideas out. Um, some of these will help in the immediate crisis, uh, but since, we were since the, the focus of this panel was on structural issues, I, I, I was thinking more kind of medium term. Uh, but some of this obviously will help in the short run. So to start with things that, that could be reformed, uh, we have an unemployment insurance uh, system. Uh, I think it works reasonably well. Um, I was uh, uh, a, a proponent of extending emergency unemployment benefits uh, back in December. And you know, knowing what I know now, I would do the same thing back in December. But that's not to say that, that the program can't be better. Um, I uh, co-authored a paper for Jared um, in his full employment project, which is fantastic, and I would, I would encourage everybody to read all the papers, um, in, uh, including especially mine, I should say, um, on work sharing. Work sharing is a very, you know, simple idea if you're a firm and, you know, so you have 100 workers and, and they all uh, earn the same wage. You need to reduce your labor costs by 20%. You can fire 20 of your workers, or you can just tell everybody to stay home on Friday. Um, and uh, if they stay home on Friday, the government gives them 20% of an unemployment check. Very simple. Uh, a lot of firms probably wouldn't want to do that, but I think uh, some would. And I think that that should be an option. The last time I checked, uh, uh, only about half the states had this as an option. I think it should be an option in every state. I think the federal government should do things to make it an option in every state. Um, and I think that the governors and, and, and other folks should use the bully pulpit to make sure that businesses know that, that this option is out there. Uh, because I think a lot of them would, would rather do that than lay off a whole bunch of people. And, and, and keeping people in jobs, especially in a massive downturn like we've had, where you had you know, six, seven uh, job seekers for every job opening, keeping people in jobs helps avoid the massive problems that we're trying to deal with. So that's, that's one kind of structural reform that, that I think we should be doing. Um, I think we should be offering relocation assistance uh, to uh, long-term unemployed workers. If you're a 50, 55-year-old guy who you know, didn't graduate high school and you drive a truck um, in New Jersey, it's going to be pretty hard for you to get another job. Uh, and you're going to have to wait a long time in order for, for the economy in New Jersey to heal. You know, with, you know, New Jersey had historically high unemployment relative to the other states, relatively high unemployment uh, to the, compared to the other states. You know, so it's fine. I mean, we can give that guy 99 weeks of unemployment benefits. And, and like I said, that's you know, better than, than having him starve to death. Um, but what would be even better than that would be to give him the opportunity to uh, take a check from the federal government or a loan or whatever. Uh, so he could uh, pay uh, his moving costs to move to North Dakota or Texas or, or a place with really low unemployment where he has a much better shot at getting a job. Um, that's the kind of structural reform that empowers people and encourages work. It's not just 
trying to, to provide for someone's material needs, but it's trying to help them get a job again. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think a lot that, that, that would have helped a lot of people out. And in future downturns, I think it, it, uh, it, it would as well. So that's something I think we need to look into. Um, that idea is, has, is bipartisan. There's a, a liberal Democrat uh, a congressman from California named Tony Cardenas and a Tea Party Republican named Mick Mulvaney from South Carolina who've come together in the, in the House to uh, put, put that together. And I have been working with them. Um, I mean, it's not going to go anywhere because, you know, there's a Senate still. But um, I, uh, so, so those, are, those are some reforms to unemployment insurance. Other things, too, lump sum, bonus, lump sum payments, reemployment bonuses. There's been some experiments, and some of that has been shown to work. That's, that's more kind of quibbling around the margins. Um, we have a food stamp program. I like the food stamp program. In a nation as wealthy as the United States, people shouldn't starve to death. Um, but uh, we should uh, have, be having a serious discussion about uh, whether we need to beef up the, the work or work-related requirements for able-bodied recipients with no dependent children. You know, if you've got three kids at home, it's one thing. If you're, you know, a 35-year-old guy with no one to take care of and, you know, you're of sound mind and body, then, you know, maybe you should at least be volunteering or, you know, doing something, um, uh, preferably working. Um, that's something that I think, you know, could help put more people in uh, into uh, into the labor market. Um, Social Security and Medicare, also great programs. I think we need to raise the retirement age, uh, uh, maybe take away the payroll tax for the last few years of the person's, of the person's life so that those years uh, are more, uh, relatively more lucrative than they currently are. That, again, would increase uh, participation. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, you know, you need to do it in a thoughtful way. If you've been working in construction or, or manufacturing, you know, by the time you're 65, your body may be shot, even if you've got 20 more years of life left to live. But in certain occupations among certain, you know, uh, industries, you know, you really can work for longer than that. And, um, and that's something that, that, that we need to adjust, a reform that, that we need, to, that we need to, to at least consider. Occupational licensing, this is something I've talked with, with Jennifer about a, a couple of times. Um, the uh, average number of days that a cosmetologist spends in training to get her license is 372. The average number of days that an emergency medical technician spends to get his license is 33. That's an order of magnitude less. Um, that's quite, quite something, and you know, obviously represents a pretty serious problem. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, you know, I think keeping people out of working probably. Um, you can imagine someone who's been unemployed for seven or eight months who, you know, may say, hey, you know, I, you know, maybe I want to cut hair. You know, oh, but I have to, you know, write a thousand dollar check to the state of New York and sit in the classroom for a thousand hours. So instead, I'm gonna, you know, not start a uh, barbershop or, or whatever. Um, uh, in, in, any, in any case, it's, it's completely out of whack and totally ridiculous. Um, the Affordable Care Act is kind of a sensitive subject, um, but the, the last time I checked, the Congressional Budget Office said that it would reduce uh, labor supply by the equivalent of 2.5 million workers. That is a lot, over the next 10-year period, uh, uh, by 2024, that is a lot of workers. Um, Again, you know, I imagine a lot of people in this room are sympathetic to the to the Affordable Care Act, but uh, you know, and, and it's a normative decision whether whether the the costs are worth the benefits. But I think we have to at least acknowledge the costs, um, and that's that's a that's a pretty large reduction in labor supply. Um, and you know, maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. Uh, but you know, thinking, you know, I would argue that that you know there there are better ways to achieve achieve the goal of, of healthcare access for people and. That those should be designed in such a way to be really careful about the the labor supply effects. Um, I think I think Jacob's suggestion of completely severing uh, uh, work and um, and health insurance is is, uh, is the right goal to work towards. Um, uh, not so wild about about the single payer, but um, we have a, we have a disability insurance uh, program that is also out of control. Uh, in 1989, 2.3% of uh, working age adults were uh, SSDI recipients. Uh, by 2009, that share had doubled to 4.6%. That's pretty staggering when you consider that over that time period, uh, healthcare improved, uh, uh, the work workplaces were safer, more people shifted from manufacturing into a services economy. There's no reason why we should have twice as many, uh, twice, uh, twice as many uh, uh, working age adults on SSDI. Uh, as a share of the of 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 of, of the population, um, at least no obvious reason why. Um, there are more people uh, receiving SSDI benefits than are than work in the construction industry, 
you know, that's, 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 that's quite something. I just got a note that said I should wrap up, which I should. It's been a long day. Um, so what are some things that could be done well, uh, that, that, that uh, opportunities for the government to give folks a hand up? Uh, better transportation networks. There's been some, some good research uh, lately, a couple of good papers that suggest that uh, if commute times were shorter from low-income communities to uh, commercial centers, that more people would be working, especially low-income workers. Uh, to me, and I agree with Jared about this, this is, a, this is an absolute no-brainer. Let's, let's you know, build some roads and, and do things with, with, with bus lines and, and uh, you know, try, and, try, and, try and cut that commute time from two hours down to one so more people can be working. I think, I think that's, that's obvious that if you care about low-income people working, then, then, then you should agree. Uh, High-skilled immigration reform, people have talked about. That's, that's a big one. A big one for me also is the earned income tax credit. Uh, in 2014, um, a childless worker could get about 500 bucks. A worker with three kids could get 6,000. Again, that's another that's an, another order of magnitude difference. Now we, we want to you know we want to give more to families than single people, but we should be giving more to single people than we are. If our experience with women in the 90s is any indication, if we did that, that would draw more men in. Uh, so I'll stop. Uh, uh, I've got more, uh, uh, but I'll stop. Uh, uh, you know. So the the broad theme is that we have a lot of programs, and a lot of them are good, uh, but could be improved and they could be improved along ways that that encourage labor supply and that get more people working which is which is i think what what everybody wants to do both uh today and over the medium term and there are opportunities for active government uh programs to really help people especially low-income people get into the workforce which is which is something that i think should be a paramount social goal and and something that that public policy should play a, a, a big role in so thank you Thanks. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, but before we go there, I just wanted to see if any of the panelists wanted to either vigorously agree or uh, disagree with um, any of the ideas that um, their fellow panelists had put forward. Jenny? I just wanted to, to point out a couple of things. So I, too, am a big fan of uh, short time compensation, as both uh, Jacob and Michael uh, proposed. I want to point out that the government is, in fact, uh, encouraging this part of the Recovery Act. Money has gone to DOL, which is helping states uh, either set up or transform their short time compensation system. So Rhode Island is the leader here, and we're trying to uh, let everyone learn from Rhode Island. I will also point out, though, that this is a policy to soften the blow in the downturn. It's, so this is something we're setting in place for the next recession, but I think it's a great idea. Uh, relocation dollars, I thought I'd just mention also that's part of a proposal in the, the president's budget for a new uh, system of, of training that would include a component with that in there. So I, I think in some of the policies we're we're not only in agreement, but we're, we're already working on it. And I'll just add, um, Kurzarbeit, uh, work sharing, and short time compensation are all pretty much the same thing. <laughs> just so it sounds confusing, they all have different names, and it is the law of the land. And um, uh, Michael and Kevin Hassett wrote a, a very nice paper for us, but another very nice paper was recently written for the Hamilton Project by uh, Kathy Abraham and Sue Hausman. And if you put it all together, really what we have to do to get more of that is to get state administrators familiar with the program. I'm convinced that uh, um, it's an informational, uh, in no small part, an informational issue. Um, I will say I uh, fully endorse this uh, EITC expansion to childless adults, and I do think it's pro-work. Um, and as Michael suggested, that's uh, uh, somewhat, has a lot more bipartisan support than, than you might think. Um, although I'm sure <laughs> that doesn't mean it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I would say on the Affordable Care Act, just to be clear, and you're absolutely right, we shouldn't uh, have, a, have, a, have a drag down about that. Um, most, of the, um, uh, most of the employment effects that you're citing are voluntary. There are people who um, are getting out of job lock because they now have access to the exchange in an affordable way that they didn't have before. And so they're deciding to work less, which is, I think, fine. I mean, I think a lot of what we're talking about today is people who want to work and can't, can't find jobs. And then finally, I fully agree that overtrained cosm cosmetologists <laughs> are, you know, a very big problem in this country. <laughs> can, I, can I respond to Jared for just two seconds? Um, I... Uh, 
I also agree that overtrained cosmetologists are a big problem. <laughs> um, I uh, have no problem with mitigating job lock and in, in, in working towards severing the link between uh, employment and healthcare would uh, eliminate job lock, um, at least as it's conventionally defined. Uh, a lot of the reduction in labor supply, though, was a response to the phase out of the insurance subsidies. It was not you know, people wanting to, as, as Mrs. Pelosi said, wanting to, you know, go be poets or, or whatever else, and they don't have to stay in their job to, uh, to keep their health insurance. So, you know, uh, uh, killing job lock, good. If you're only in the job for health insurance um, and the Affordable Care Act allows you to get out of that, then that's, that probably is a welfare maximizing innovation. Um, but uh, uh, the problem is the phase out of the insurance subsidies and the fact that the subsidies are so generous and they go so high, so high up the up the income scale. And, and that you know, is a choice in, in, in the same sense that, you know, many things are choices, but, but it's not, you know, it's not responding to, to prices and preferences. It's responding to public policy. Thanks. Um, you guys are touching on a couple of questions that I had that I don't think we have time to get into, but just, uh, you know, what levers do, you know, a lot of what you mentioned have to do with state government. So what levers does the federal government um, uh, have in this regard? And also, kind of just the cultural issues that are playing into the overtraining of cosmetologists, and um, you know, in whether these uh, uh, lessons from Europe, the reforms suggested by the European uh, uh, experience, uh, really could be adapted to this country. But we can save that for the next conference. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Adam, why don't we start with you? Um, I. Thanks for all the kind words. I think this panel hit exactly what I was hoping it would, and I'm grateful for that. I I, I really would like to actually pick up, in a sense, a, a narrow version of the question Karen said we didn't have time yet for. Maybe we can have a, a time for a narrow response, particularly to Jacob and, and Jennifer. Um, realistically speaking, okay, let's, let's take Jacob's words of wisdom about don't do anything stupid. Let's let's agree that that's not going to happen, but we'd like that. If if instead, and this is also in the spirit of things Julie Hotchkiss was saying earlier, if instead we wanted to try to increase labor supply, whether it's female labor supply or or, or young people labor supply, what, whatever you think is the the primary margin you want to go on, realistically, how big a number can can we can we create i mean when we think across countries you know there have been major reforms in various countries germany denmark but other places as well um on what sort of time frame and what sort of magnitudes if you do a big reform can you get out of this or is it all just i mean obviously when we're talking millions of people and and the importance of work as michael says anything is good but are there big ticket things you can do about labor suppliers and a lot of little things I would like to phrase things again as I phrased it in my talk, which is to talk about removing obstacles to a work for people who want to work. And uh, I think on the female side, you can get kind of a ballpark idea by looking just at the graph. It looks like we're probably not going to get above the peak where we were before. So um, let's let's call that the you know the the possible. Oh, or you could, well, let, actually, let's not take Sweden because Sweden is a bad, we could take another country. Sweden is a bad example because uh, the reason it's so high is because of women on maternity leave that counts as being in the labor force and they're very, very long. Um, so, but if you look at prime age, uh, I think, the, would that give you about the same answer as looking at the peak of the US? No, the US even at its peak would probably be somewhat below but i think i think we're talking about if we look at the the total i think we're talking about you know th three or four percentage points m but maximum um and and that would uh i think uh cost a lot and then the the men it's a lot less clear uh what what you would do some of the issue at the lower end of the distribution is the wages are so low so eitc you know, help some of that, not so much in recessions when the problem is a lack of demand. But uh, 
Um, but I, I think we're really not, I'm not so sure how much we can do about the male labor supply. And this is talking about, uh, unless you want to, there's lots of expensive things you could do to uh, bring in the, the older workers. It's already increasing, actually, but you could, you could reform Social Security in certain ways. Uh, that would be one possibility if your aim were to get more people working. I mean, I, I think what can realistically be achieved, I mean, I think, I think if you look at large G7 countries, I think I can only count one country that in, in, in over a relatively short period in recent time have managed to expand employment population ratio by about 5%, and that's Germany, uh, uh, after 2005. And uh, I think there is a lot of misperceptions about why that is. Uh, there's no doubt that wage restraint, uh, uh, you know, the whole euro uh, uh, issue has something to do with it. But it also, but I would argue that actually for German, the German domestic economy, uh, the euro introduction is not that important because, you know, Germany didn't get any different interest rates. Uh, uh, you know, everybody else got that. Uh, the, what changed for Germany was the external environment, but that's a different issue. Uh, but what is clear that when people talk about the Schroeder reforms, Hartz, Fear, etc., is that this wasn't a sort of hodgepodge of, of uh, uh, sort of small individual things. This was actually a, a sustained five-year uh, or so program that counted a lot of different things. They did the functional equivalent of massively reforming Social Security. They raised retirement age. They phased out and, no, and uh, quite a lot of the policy mistakes that I talked about earlier, which was these excessively generous access to early retirement uh, in Germany. And you can see it. I mean, uh, uh, participation in Germany for 55 to 64 is up by a third, you know, 15 to 20 percentage points uh, uh, after 2005. They fundamentally reformed and put a lot of extra money into uh, the German uh, public uh, job uh, uh, labor market offices, the Bundesagentur für Arbeit. Uh, <clears throat> um, they, uh, and this is uh, Hartz IV, they lowered the reservation wage, and as I think Adam also mentioned, they cut uh, long term unemployment benefits quite dramatically. Uh, uh, so that people would be, uh, uh, you know, more incentivized to do it. And then they created a whole new host of worker categories, low-wage, uh, low many of them, uh, worker categories in Germany, so-called mini-jobs and others. So, so this, the, the whole point about this is that this wasn't sort of nippling at the margins. This was a sustained over several years. It actually, in many ways, I would argue, fairly well thought through comprehensive reforms. Uh, uh, and, and if you do that, uh, which uh, may require the kind of political you know, stability that you at the end of the day have in a place like Germany, then you can actually achieve relatively uh, a significant results. And I mean, it is just worth mentioning that you know, Germany again today has, a, has the highest employment population ratio in the G7 uh, by a significant margin. And that is entirely new. Uh, so you can actually achieve quite big things, but you've got to do it by reforming, not piecemeal, uh, but you've got to reform all different levers and, and uh, parts of the labor market. I would point out that a lot of those, uh, that increase in the employment rate is coming from reducing unemployment, it seems like. So it's not uh, as much on the participation margin as it is in reducing unemployment and getting people into low-wage jobs. There does seem to have been a trade-off uh, between, as one would expect in the textbook, um, between the lower unemployment and, and, and good wages? Oh, no, I mean, there's no doubt that part of these reforms in Germany came from creating a much larger low-wage uh, workforce. There's no doubt about that. And I think this was, in the case of Germany, a, a very uh, a direct uh, uh, choice. And I think Chancellor Schroeder was very uh, explicit about it when he campaigned in favor of this. He said, we want to move people out of uh, uh, you know, uh, into uh, or from inactivity, from on a long term unemployment, which is de facto inactivity if, if, uh, if, uh, if unemployment benefits are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forever and you don't have to search for work by getting them, that's inactivity uh, uh, for you. You want to take people out of that and into low wage work because we cannot afford. It was a fiscal uh, argument almost. So, so certainly there is that element to it, absolutely. 
Um, uh, other questions? There are other people I saw Andy's hand up, so maybe we'll make this the last question. So I just I wanted to come back to Jennifer's talk because it seems crucial. I mean, I agree with all the structural reforms you have talked about and that Julie mentioned this morning, um, but it still seems crucial to, to you know gauge how much is slack, how much is that accounting for. So I just want to flag two facts here. One of them is this Pew study that was published in April. It says, a growing share of stay-at-home mothers, 6% in 2012 compared to 1% before the crisis, say they are home with their children because they cannot find a job. So again, the, the survey evidence here seems pretty clear, and that was a couple of years ago, but that a very substantial fraction of the uh, stay-at-home moms, which we mostly say 25, 35 years old, maybe 40, um, were, that was in fact because they couldn't find a job. The other thing that's interesting and important you can't quite see very clearly in Jennifer's pictures is that there is no downward trend after 2000 in females 45 to 54. There just simply isn't. I have it here on the screen. Anyone who wants to walk over after we're done and can look. I literally just pulled it off the BLS website 20 minutes ago. Um, the, the 45 to 50 year old female participation was rising steadily till about 98. And from 1998 until 2007, it was within a one percentile range from 76 to 77. In 2009, it started falling off. And in the latest data, it's down at 74. So it fell two percentage points. This is very relevant for thinking about all, all the discussion we had this morning. Because here's a group that actually seemed very stable. They stabilized after 2000. This is not the prime age males where there is some mystery about the long run trend. These, this group stabilized. And these are 45 to 54 year olds. They don't probably have a lot of young children at home. So these things about childcare and so forth, which you can agree with. So bottom line here is at the same time we're trying to expand the labor supply, you've got to provide the jobs for these people. And, and as you mentioned, Jennifer, the big problem with underemployment um, you know, is there as well. So there's a lot of evidence that there's still significant slack relevant for, for prime age females. Right, so, so 45 to 49 actually falls uh, over the period, and then uh, 50 to 54 is the same, and then above that it's increasing as it is for men. So it is a bit, it, it's, it's twisting, really. The, the middle is falling and the, the older ages are rising, and it ha happens to happen in the middle of that age range that you're looking at. Okay. Um, why don't we wrap up this panel the same way we wrapped up the last panel, which is I'm going to put you all on the spot. So, um, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of different ideas here. Um, I'll give you 15 seconds to uh, just say, you know, which, which is your favorite? What, what would be the best thing we could do for U.S. labor markets right now? It does not have to be a structural reform. If you want to take the let's do something on the demand side um, stand, that's okay, too. So, Jared, start with you. A real deep dive into investment in improving our stock of public goods. Jenny? <laughs> I was essentially going to do the same thing. I was going to say invest in infrastructure. <laughs> well, then I will switch my one and two and say immigration reform. Um, <laughs> well, now, now I have nothing. Um, I, <laughs> I, would, I, would, uh, I would expand the earned income tax credit um, uh, uh, more than the president has proposed hmm. uh, uh, for childless workers for a number of reasons. Great. A lot of good suggestions. And I would return us to the gold standard. Yeah. As well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and shorten the licensing period for co cosmologists. <laughs> I was going to say a lot of good suggestions, but I'm not going to say it now. Um, all right. So I want to thank uh, the panelists uh, for doing such a great job. And thank Adam for inviting us to do this. It was a really great panel. And now turn things over to Adam. Uh, just quickly, uh, Karen did the great thing, even better than on hell, of getting people on the spot and getting something interesting out of them. This was a terrific panel. Uh, some of you have stuck with us the whole day, which I'm very impressed with and grateful for. Um, I'm grateful particularly to Danny Blanchflower and Annie Levin who helped me get this off the ground. 
I'm very grateful to Yvonne, Jessica, and our meetings team who, when we decided to have technological regress today, uh, managed to get things afloat. And uh, I'm very grateful to everyone for contributing the spirit with which this was meant, whether Larry Ball has his corrections of my nomenclature right or uh, Jacob's views on uh, on structural versus cyclical are right. I think we engage with the issues in a very in-depth, serious, and practical way, which was the goal of this and most Peterson Institute things. And thank you all for contributing.